Thanks. I would like to extend uh, my congratulations to all of you for getting up <laughs> in the morning on a, on a weekend, because uh, for most musicians, uh, that's a difficult thing to do. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a, a hopefully uh, uh, a, just a cyclic event in the, in the uh, songwriter's world where uh, there was a glorious era where a Celine Dion could sell 45 million uh, units of a CD and uh, make tons of money and get her music out there. These days she's fortunate if she sells three or four million. That's a 90% decline in sales. Uh, a recent cut that I had with Bonnie Raitt, where at her peak she sold eight million records, uh, lucky to sell three or four hundred uh, thousand uh, units, so there's this huge decline. There are many reasons for it, but uh, um, it's not what I'm here I'm, uh, to talk about. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the many stories that I have of how my songs have gotten recorded, the, the long trajectory of what it takes from actually putting a song together by yourself and seeing it get out in the world and the process of how that, how that can happen, how easy it can be and how difficult it can be. Um, some years ago, I was living in Los Angeles and my uh, greatest skill at the time was a key, as a keyboard player. I hadn't been writing that much and I had the good fortune as a studio musician to play on records for some of the biggest producers at the time. Record producers like David Foster and like Umberto Gatica who does Celine Dion, like John Boylan who did Little, Little River Band and uh, uh, Charlie Daniels. Um, and I was sort of a, a journeyman keyboard player hired to play on all these sessions. So uh, I had the uh, good fortune uh, to be put in touch with an artist uh, who had been sent to LA from South Africa to do some uh, recording, to do some demos. And um, while uh, we were doing uh, some demos, uh, we got together and uh, somebody encouraged me and this artist, Byron Duplessis was his name, to write a song together. And uh, so we wrote this song didn't think too much about it, but the uh, the people who had sent him out, a small record label from South Africa, really loved the song and encouraged, uh, encouraged us to get together and write some more. So um, I, I ended up thinking, well, what do I do with a uh, uh, an artist from South Africa? Nobody's ever heard of him. And... Uh, um, He's in a certain kind of style. It's a little bit African, a little bit pop, a little bit kind of R&B. Uh, shall I just uh, write with him in that style in the United States and California, or what are we going to do? So I had the idea just, uh, Paul Simon had just done an album uh, in South Africa, and it was pretty inspiring. And I thought, well, if the company's going to pay, why don't I go down to Johannesburg and record this guy? And we'll take those songs and see if we can get him a record deal. So the record label paid for me to go to South Africa. We wrote together. And uh, I'm going to play you a whole bunch of bits and pieces of songs that uh, followed the trajectory from where we started to where we ended up with um, a hit song of one kind or another. So uh, the very first song that Byron and I wrote together was kind of a generic pop song that we hadn't really delved into the African side of things. It was called Love Has the Power. We played the, the song around for people and everybody said, well, it's great, but you can't get a record deal for your artist, Byron on one song, and that's why I went to South Africa. But I'd like to play you a little piece of that one song, it's Love Has the Power, which I think you have there, and uh, yeah. uh, if you have a queued up.
range of uh, hit records in the 80s. And um, they had just lost their lead singer. And uh, they were sitting in the next office to where their song was being played. And somebody overheard the song coming through the wall. And they said, who's that? And so they barged into the next room, said, who's this guy? And uh, uh, Byron, who was my artist, who I was trying to get a deal for, was offered a deal to become the lead singer of Toto. I said, well, what would you say to $10,000 a week and a world tour? So he said, well, you know, but I'm looking for my own uh, record deal. But, you know, I just came from South Africa, and this was before uh, Nelson Mandela had been released, and he was a black guy still living under apartheid, and I uh, thought, well, I could go back to South Africa or $10,000 a week in a world tour with Toto. So I lost my artist. Off he went, joined Toto, became their lead singer, and if you look on... look. Look this up on uh, YouTube, Love Has the Power by Toto. Uh, you'll see a video of him in front of an audience of about 30,000 people in Paris, France, singing this song. And so I sort of treasure this as the little photograph of uh, what could have been. But um, Toto went on to uh, record the song. That version that you just uh, heard is on a best of Toto album that's still available in the stores, sold I don't know how many million copies and is still selling because it's on a best of album. Most of their big hits plus uh, one or two additional, including this song, Love Has the Power, which is all very nice for me as a songwriter. Um, however, uh, I was hoping to develop this artist, to uh, be the producer, to be the writer of the, the whole thing and see him through his career. Uh, he joined Toto. Uh, after a year, they decided they didn't like him that much because he, uh, the culturally, there was such a disconnect between where he came from and where they were going. And uh, he left the band and nobody's ever heard from him since. So that's uh, one uh, uh, trajectory that, that, this, uh, that, that happened with this situation. So uh, for my career, it was, uh, it kind of hit a bit of a brick wall. Had this song got recorded by a very famous band uh, was out there in the world, but I lost it to, uh, to uh, a situation that happened. So, um, my trip to South Africa got me fascinated with uh, African music, and I, I understood that um, the music of Africa really is the roots of where rock and roll first began. It was when uh, the slaves came to uh, to uh, North America and brought the music and mixed it up with Irish and Scottish and religious music and it all blended and became the, the roots of American popular music back uh, uh, when, when uh, all, all that immigration happened. And in my fascination with that music, I decided that, well, I've lost my artist, what am I going to do now? I love this music. I'm just going to go back to South Africa and I'm going to see what I can find and do my own album. So up I went with a little help from a record label there. Uh, I'd made friends uh, with them while I was there developing Byron and uh, got a little budget together, got some sponsorship, got some help and went to South Africa without de having a definite plan and decided to record a John K. Beck solo album, which is very difficult because I don't sing. Um, I just play the piano. But the idea was to see what I could find and put the pieces together. So off I went to uh, South Africa, still um, just on the cusp of when uh, uh, something was about to happen in that country, around the time that uh, there were rumors that Nelson Mandela was going to be released. So um, I'm on a plane. Uh, I uh, uh, had been in Europe, and my flight, I think, uh, you had to go this circuitous route to get down there because none of the African countries at the time would allow you to, to land anywhere. You had to sort of follow the coastline down from the top of Africa down to South Africa, because they were all against the apartheid regime. And uh, uh, my plane was full of CNN reporters who'd heard the rumor that Nelson Mandela was going to be released. So it was this fascinating flight talking to all these guys and uh, whose uh, job it really was to follow from crisis to crisis around the world. And um, from that, I sort of got a little bit of an idea of what my album should be, a bit of a photograph, a historical photograph 
of what was going on in the world, and that's what it became. Um, so I'm going to play you just uh, one song from that album. Um, it's called Sangoma. Now, Sangoma is a, uh, uh, I guess the best English word for it is a witch doctor. And these are women who do, do nothing but meditate and dance. And they dance until they get in a trance. And they dance for hours and hours and hours and supposedly cast spells. And so um, part of this found music that I found in South Africa, I took little bits and pieces like a collage, like you would uh, sampling, like hip hop people do these days, and put these pieces together and created a song about these uh, dancing witch doctors, the Sangoma women. And this is one of the songs. So. Sangoma. influenced uh, whatever I do just because it's uh, I look to it for the roots of, uh, of uh, American popular music anyway um, in the meantime I'd had the good fortune to have a song recorded by Rod Stewart became a big international hit uh, uh, rhythm of my heart and we were looking for a, a follow-up the fellow who was a uh, and ring who was responsible for choosing songs for Rod Stewart was the uh, uh, chief uh, executive officer of Warner Records in England. And he became a real big, really big fan of the music that uh, I and my partner, Mark Jordan, had been writing. He just loved all the songs, everything that we were doing. So I sent him my African album, what you just listened to, and he said, well, you know, this is Warner Records. This is uh, you know, not the kind of album that we do. Um, I love what you did, but this is your you know, artistic uh, whatever it is that you wanted to do. I can't do anything with your, uh, your South African uh, you know, ego trip here. Um, uh, we're looking for songs for Rod Stewart. Um, but there was one song, it's the CEO, the head of Warner Records in England, big executive, He's responsible. he was responsible at the time for choosing songs for... Uh, um, 
trying to think. Well, ultimately, it was Cher for um, um, Seal. He developed Seal's career, Anya's career. It's about half a dozen people who he was, he was uh, responsible for and behind and choosing songs and uh, uh, planning out the trajectory of their recording careers. So it was a very, very important guy. So he calls me up and says, you know, you sent me this, this uh, African thing. I can't do anything with it. But, and this is going to be on the third uh, CD I, I gave you. Um, he said, there's one song on there that I kind of like the feel of it. Um, and maybe if you and uh, Mark um, take, have a listen to this song and see if there, there's anything that you can do with it that maybe Rod Stewart would like. Rod Stewart was coming off of uh, Hot Legs and you know, his kind of disco commercial era, and he'd lost his credibility. And uh, what they were trying to do with Rhythm of My Heart and some of the more important songs that he did, uh, uh, Broken Arrow and songs like that, uh, to do uh, more serious songwriter type songs. And that's uh, to establish him as a more serious contender. Um, he'd just come off of selling a tremendous number of records with the rhythm of my heart, with the song, with the album that that was on. So they wanted to sustain that. So he said, have a listen to this song off your African album, and uh, we'll play it now and see if we can do something. Amen, hallelujah, hallelujah. pointed to this tune, and I, I couldn't see the connection at all. You know, how's Rod Stewart going to do anything with anything like this? This is a South African hymn. Um, it wasn't making any sense at all. And so my songwriting partner, Mark, um, we talked about it, played it for him, and trying to figure out, well, is Rod Stewart going to sing Hallelujah? It just didn't, didn't kind of make sense in his commercial pop career. But uh, we didn't want to say no. We, we tried, wanted to try our best without losing the integrity of, our, uh, of what we were doing. Uh, this wasn't like a make work crafted kind of thing. Let's just uh, stick some words on there and give it to Rod Stewart. We wanted to keep the artistic side of things. So uh, we went off into the studio, Mark listened to the thing and said, well, 
currently it's an instrumental, at least it needs some words. So uh, Mark put some words on it, and uh, this was the second generation of Hallelujah, the next track with uh, Mark Jordan in a demo version putting uh, words to this tune. It's a bit soft on this We sent that off to Rob Dickens in England and uh, called him up a couple of weeks later and said, well, what do you think? Are we achieving heaviosity here? Is this uh, going to work for Rod Stewart? And he says, you've got to be kidding. This is ridiculous. You know, Rod's never going to sing Hallelujah. You don't understand what I'm saying. I just want you to get some of the undercurrent of feel of that song. I don't want that song with words. That's not what I want. Now, this is a very, very strange instruction to get. You know, what, what do you do with that? It reminds me of when I used to do jingles, when you have a bunch of clients coming from the ad agency and they say, well, can you make the music a little more kind of yellow? And, uh, you know, I don't know what that means. I'm a musician. You know, I play the piano. How do you make it more yellow? Or, or, or can you get, you know, when the girls sing, can you get them to, to you know, have a, more of a kind of empathic expression on their face when they sing? Well, it's not a video. This was an audio thing. You know, it makes absolutely no difference. So we kind of didn't know what he was talking about. We just want to get the sense of it. And it's very frustrating because uh, we wanted to uh, be in there. Uh, we had built a relationship with this guy, which is one of the most difficult things to do in, in the business, to actually get somebody on your team and on your side. He's encouraging us uh, to write, but we're not communicating. I don't understand what he means. So Mark and I got together and said, well, um, let's try another tangent. Let's see what we can do. But, by the way, as, as I uh, present these uh, things, if you think of any questions, please write them down, because once I'm done with this, I, I'm open to, to discuss anything, uh, any questions you have. Um, so um, we thought, well, let's just take the chord structure. Whatever the, the chords were to this tune, I'll take those chords, we'll put the chords down without any of the melody, 
without, uh, you know, without uh, a lot of that feel, just those chord changes and see if that's what he means. So we took the chord changes, Mark took that home, we worked out a melody, we worked out a whole new set of lyrics, just basically on, on, the, on the root structure of this tune and wrote a whole other tune. And uh, that's the next one on the tape. This is about, we're about three, four months into this process now. to England uh, for Rob to listen to it. Uh, Warner's had a subsidiary in Toronto and we went to the publisher and played it just to test it out. Um, his his uh, company representatives in, in, in Toronto and she took a listen to it and said that's about the sleepiest, most boring thing I've ever heard. Don't even bother sending it. So, uh, but we sent it anyway because we'd put a lot of time and effort uh, really trying to follow this uh, guideline that we'd been given waited a week, waited two weeks, waited three weeks, um, no response whatsoever. So I guess he went into a coma when he listened to it, <laughs> whatever. So um, the funny thing was that uh, Mark, the singer, really liked it. He recorded it in the fashion that you just heard from the demo. Not too much different from the demo, just the demo with live instruments. Put it on an album uh, that year, and that album that Mark Jordan uh, had out was nominated and won a Grammy, uh, not a Grammy, a Juno Award in Canada. So we got this sort of trajectory where um, one, par, one limb of this tree went out uh, with Toto, uh, sold some, some records, did, did well. The other twig won a Juno. So, but we still haven't 
achieved our goal. So we called Rob Dickens and said, what, you know, what can we do? We'd really like to get another Rod Stewart song, and you've given us this guideline of this African thing. And he said, well, you sent me this tell me you love me thing, and, and uh, you're missing the point. It's so far removed from where we began in Africa, and you got this pop song, tell me you love me, that put me to sleep. Um, I want you to go backwards a step and go back to the African song. I still hear something there for Rod Stewart. Uh, give it another shot. So we're sort of scratching our heads, saying, what the hell does this guy want? And we went um, backwards and forwards, trying to uh, uh, go back a step, keep a little of the, the African side of things, and um, decided that, um, well, we don't really know what, uh, what to do. And um, I have a really good friend in um, Los Angeles. Um, who I've written a, a bunch of songs with. His name is Steve Kittner, and Steve uh, is one of the most successful songwriters on the planet. Um, he's sold uh, millions and millions and millions of records. And the first song, um, I, had, I had met him when I first moved to LA years and years ago, and um, I was writing with his dad, who's also a very successful songwriter. And Steve uh, uh, was brought up in Australia and has a very thick Australian accent, very funny, a jovial guy, lots of enthusiasm. I'm working in LA with uh, Steve's dad. Steve uh, walks in, I'd never met him before, he ignores me, he says, Dad, Dad, I've just written this amazing song, you've got to listen to it. And he pulls out an acoustic guitar, and he goes, let's get physical, physical. And I thought, this is the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. You know, it was a horrible song. So. You know, it was the first hit he had. It sold like about 50 million records, and uh, with Olivia Newton-John. Uh, more recently, it was uh, licensed for a uh, uh, soft drink in Japan. The license fee for that song alone was a million dollars. So Steve went on to write for all kinds of people. He wrote a song called "Hard Habit to Break" for Chicago. Um, more recently, he wrote um, for an unknown singer. He's doing this demo in his house and uh, they brought in the unknown singer that somebody had put together with them, and it became Genie in a Bottle for uh, Christina Aguilera, her first uh, big hit. And more recently than that, um, he formed a label, and the artist that's on that label is Natasha Bedingfield, so he continues his, uh, his trajectory. So Steve, I thought, what if um, we're, we're stuck in this situation? Let's uh, bring in a third writer. Let's cut him in on this partnership, because we don't know what to do. And so we sent what we had, the, the first lyric version of the song, down to Steve in Los Angeles. I think I was there at the time, said, help us. We need, we, 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 we're lost. We don't know what to do. We want to get this cut. So we sent it down to Steve, and he said, what you guys need, you know, I like the African stuff, but you need a pop chorus attached to the African thing. So he, he helped us write a chorus, a memorable chorus. And the demo of the first draft of the There's version with the third writer was Steve and the, uh, was the next one. Becomes unthinkable. 
never taste what we took for granted They don't know love at all Some of them broken, some of them wounded And so cynical from the pain I was quiet as a graveyard Chorus uh, that you, know, you hear it once, you can pretty much sing along with a big choir. And uh, well, we finally broke through. We've got the combination of the African uh, beginnings, big pop chorus that Steve uh, Kipner helped us uh, put together, and we sent that off feeling really good about ourselves. We finally got something that made sense to keeping some integrity of where our African beginning was. Big pop chorus. This has got to work. So we sent it off to uh, Rob Dickens in England. We're in six months into this process or more. And uh, didn't hear anything. We called Rob up, a CEO of Warner Records, whose, whose career trajectory was increasing and increasing with all the other projects that he was, he was becoming more and more important, but also more and more egotistical and full of himself. So you know he had the power to make or break things, which has also made things kind of difficult to deal with. So I um, called him up and said, well, what do you think? He said, well, you know, it's irrelevant what I think. Uh, you invited Steve Kipner in on the song. He wrote, let's get physical. I'm trying to resurrect Rod Stewart's career. And I, you know, we can't have somebody who wrote Let's Get Physical's name on the album. This is not a serious uh, songwriter. We're working with Tom Waits, Bob Dylan, uh, um, you know, all these serious guys. And, and we just can't have uh, Steve who wrote Let's Get Physical on this album. So forget about it. You know, it's not going to happen. So at that point, we threw up our hands and said, we, we gave it our best. Um, We'll just move on. We'll do something else. We'll keep writing other songs. So it was basically shelved and put put in a drawer, and uh, as as one has to do. I write a lot of songs. Uh, I tell uh, my songwriter classes, my my peers, uh, you need to write a lot. It's like an athletic exercise. You need to demo a lot. You get your songs as good as you can get them. If uh, three or four percent of them get get recorded, that's a good thing. Um, a good track record. I write 30 songs a year, maybe two or three of them get, get cut over the years. And if they become big cuts, it pays for all the rest. So uh, we put it in a drawer and forgot about it. About um, six months, nine months goes by, and uh, it's Mark Jordan, myself, and Steve Kipner are the three writers. And each of us was signed to a different music publisher. I was signed to one, Mark was signed to uh, Warner Music, and Steve to EMI in Los Angeles. So Steve um, gets a call um, several months later from his publisher, and they had a, a department at the publishing company that deals only in film and TV licensing. And uh, he said, uh, I got this call from the film department of my music publisher, and they're saying, um, we have this film. Uh, the film is looking for an end title theme. So the end title theme is a really big deal for a songwriter. It's the, it's the music that plays under the titles at the end of the movie as you're walking out. It's the thing that you hang on to and remember as you leave the theater. And if it's a blockbuster film like the Titanic and Celine Dion is singing, the song becomes a huge hit. This is what, uh, as songwriters, is one of the biggest coups that you can have to get an end title theme at the end of a blockbuster film. So they said, we got this film. We can't really tell you too much about it, but do you have anything? Um, they, they told him a little about the story. So he said, well, I have this thing I wrote you know, a few months ago. And he sent it in. And they said, yeah, and this is pretty good. So the film, um, in the structure of uh, a big uh, Hollywood movie, 
uh, there's the director and the producer, and they normally will hire a film music supervisor, which is a separate company whose job it is to vet and screen music for the film. So the request had come from these music supervisors. Um, and so they sent the song in, and the music supervisors listened to it, and they said, well, um, the direction that we've had from the producer, you know, we kind of like the song, and there's another song, there's another country song, it's a contender, and we're not sure which one to play for the producer and the director, because our credibility as music uh, supervisors for film is up, uh, uh, and, and we have to display that we know what we're talking about. So let's, um, uh, I have to kind of have a little discussion, and they, they did, and they said, well, uh, we've, the request that we've had is that there must be a duet. Cause, so can you get the songwriters to go back in the studio, take that same song and re-record it as a duet, and at that point we may play it for the uh, director and the, uh, the producer of the film. So off we went into the studio and uh, re-recorded the same song, this time as a duet, which is the next... Uh, demo. We sent it in to the uh, publisher. The publisher sent it to the music uh, supervision company and they said, uh, well, I think you've beaten out the competition. This is the version we're going to play for the, uh, for the director and the producer of the movie and uh, we're not telling you who's going to record the song but uh, for the moment, but we think you're in. So um, they uh, sent it off to the uh, uh, production uh, uh, people and they said, "Yeah, we we like it. You're in." And uh, 
but we like it so much, and and uh, we're going to put together a soundtrack album. We're going to put it on there, and we want uh, we're going to have uh, Joe Cocker sing it. But that soundtrack album is uh, is we're going to introduce a new group uh, called U2. Um, there's a song called With or Without You on the album. There's Aretha Franklin's on there twice. Um, there's all kinds of other people on there, and this is going to be such a, a blockbuster, and the film is so great. We need you all to sign uh, a piece of paper saying that you wrote this song specifically for the movie, and we're going to nominate you. It's going to be the single. We're going to nominate you for an Academy Award for, for this song. So, of course, um, how can you not get excited about something like that? After all this work, we're going to be up for an Academy Award. Um, so uh, off we go, like feeling good about ourselves. And there's two um, other levels that this thing has to go through. And um, the actual soundtrack album of the, of the movie is not handled by the film company, it's handled by the record label that's putting out the soundtrack album. The record label at the time was Atlantic Records. And they had an a and person, the person who supervises uh, the artist repertoire portion of how this album's going to be put together and vets the songs. And he listened to this song and said, yeah, you know, it's pretty good, but I just hate the bridge. It sucks. Go back, ask your songwriters to uh, rewrite the bridge because it's not going to make it. And if you don't rewrite the bridge, you know, forget it. It's not going on the, not going on the thing. So off we go, um, we've got this thing back, you know, our hearts in our hands. We thought, well, we're up for an Academy Award, and all of a sudden this guy says, well, if we don't rewrite the bridge successfully, it's not going to make it. Um, this was a bit of a problem, uh, and it was a bit of a creative problem because this had been through so many stages, and everybody had listened and heard and lived with this particular demo. And we thought, well, I'm in Los Angeles, Steve's in Los Angeles, Mark and Amy were in Toronto. Geographically, how are we going to rewrite the bridge and not have to completely re-record the whole demo and ruin it for everybody? We wanted to keep every other part of it intact uh, without destroying the song, without anybody thinking anything's changed. So we got on these several conference calls and rewrote the bridge um, over the phone, new melody, new lyrics, just for that bridge portion. And then um, Mark in Toronto went into the studio and just recorded that small portion of the song. FedEx is down to us, um, and we went into a Pro Tools studio and started to cut the bridge, just that section, into everything that was already uh, there and original, what everybody had become accustomed to. Unbeknownst to us, it was in the days of tape, and uh, something had gone wrong. And there was a little discrepancy in, uh, in the pitch. And the bridge that Mark had re-recorded was a little bit sharp and a little bit faster than all the rest of the, the song. As we tried to cut it in, nothing was working. It just sounded stupid. So um, we spent, I don't know, it must have been a couple of thousand dollars in the Pro Tools studio for a day and a half trying to seamlessly insert this little portion into the song, not really knowing if it was the right thing and if this guy was going to like it or say, dump the song because I still hate the bridge. Anyway, here's a little piece of uh, the song with a new bridge cut into it. cost of thousands of dollars. We're a year into this already, and that year of constantly rewriting, re-demoing was very expensive. It was time-consuming, it was soul-destroying, it was, uh, it was uh, frustrating. 
Finally, we had a version that everybody seemed to like. We were signing off on Academy Award nominations, and uh, then uh, we get, I get this call. Um, when you license a song for a movie, especially with uh, known successful songwriters, the film company has to pay what's called a sync fee. Um, and there's two licenses that they have to pay, one for the artist, who's the person who's going to sing it, and one for the writers. So there were three writers on this. And um, because, uh, especially because Steve had such a great reputation, he's commanding fees, license fees, as I mentioned, to the tune of a million dollars. And so we go to this movie, and these license fees are often calculated based on the budget of the film. If it's a $4 million film, it's one thing. If it's a $40 million film, it's another thing what they're going to pay the writers. There are a lot of uh, famous people on this soundtrack. There's Aretha Franklin, there's U2. They're all commanding fees. They have a budget that they, they have, whatever they have, a million dollars, they're going to spread amongst all the singers and all the songwriters. So I get a call from uh, my publisher saying, um, you know, the, the film company has phoned us up and said that Steve is asking for, t his publisher is asking for way too much money and he's asking for so much money, we're going to dump, dump the song. Right. And then um, I get a call from Mark, Mark Jordan, saying, the film company just called me. Your publisher is asking for way too much money for you. And uh, if, if they take that stand and ask for so much money, we're going to dump the song. Steve gets a call from the film company saying, Mark Jordan's publisher is asking for way too much money, and if uh, he, he takes a stand and asks for this much money, we're going to dump the song. So what we realized after this went on for a couple of weeks, that they were playing us. They were just trying to lowball this amount of money and, and get us arguing with it, which in the first week we did. I called up Mark and said, what are you doing? You know, we've got this great opportunity. Why are you holding out for all this money? He said, I'm not. And then I called Steve and they said, why are you? He said, I'm not. So the, the lawyers at the film company were playing this game of trying to get our, our price down. So once we realized what was going on and all the publishers started to communicate, we figured out what was a reasonable price and we, everything was fine. And they said, OK, you're in. It's a done deal. It's Joe Cocker and it's going to happen and it's going to be a single. So there we were. This uh, film comes out, three people went to see it, the soundtrack album came out, three people bought it, and the whole thing took a nosedive. So, um, in any case, I'm going to play you the Joe Cocker version of it.
were disappointed, but that's not the end of the story. Shortly after that, Joe Cocker did a solo album, which is separate from the soundtrack album of the movie. On that solo album, he included our song, Take Me Home. It's on the album, it was released all over the world, and lo and behold, all over Europe, this album charted, was top 10 in all kinds of countries, huge in Germany, huge in France, huge in Scandinavia. Went on to sell approximately three million records. And so, in a way, these two and a half years of effort paid off, not exactly as we would have liked, but uh, at least um, in some way. The film Blown Away has become cable fodder. You'll see it, you know, it's on cable somewhere about once a week. Uh, sometimes on network, when it's on network, uh, the performances that it pays, if it's on network in the United States, uh, is quite a lot of money. So it continues to generate income years and years after the fact. And it's also, it's become a bit of a standard. Other people have recorded it. I'll play you one more version of it, which is uh, the last version. I can't remember the name of the artist, but she was very popular back, back then. I'll, I'll try and think of it. <laughs> from Rob Dickens, uh, the whole Rod Stewart thing, that was a whole other world. Fortunately, our relationship was maintained and uh, Rod Stewart uh, ended up recording a whole bunch more of, of my songs and uh, my and Mark Jordan's songs. So that uh, relationship continued on. Uh, this uh, went the way that it went, not exactly as we would have hoped, but three million records is nothing to sneeze at. So. Um, and uh, in uh, the current market, uh, uh, it would be very difficult to sell that many records. So at the time, uh, it was pretty good. Um, so that's the story uh, from all the way from Africa to uh, Joe Cocker in the movie. It's uh, an unusual trajectory in some ways, but it's not that easy in the world of the journeyman songwriter, which is what I am. I'm not a performer. I'm not a singer-songwriter, I'm a songwriter. I write songs and hope to get them to artists. When I write my songs, I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write a song for whoever, for Celine Dion, or I'm going to write a song for Rod Stewart. I generally write the best song that I can. I usually work with partners. Most of my partners are great singers, Mark Jordan, Amy Skye, Dan Hill, uh, Steve, whoever and the inspiration of their vocals and their voices is what inspires me. When I write with Mark, we're usually writing for Mark. When I write with Amy, we're writing for Amy. If somebody else wants to do the song, that's our good fortune. Um, but uh, I never have tried to write specifically for a situation. I just try and write the best possible song that I can. So that's... Uh, the anatomy and maybe the dissection of the trajectory of uh, one song and the drama that it went through. And it was a lot of drama, it was a lot of time, and a lot of effort and a lot of money to get from one place to another. And I'm involved in these kind of situations uh, quite a lot. <laughs> 